I'm Sarah Storelli, on a quest to discover the people behind the cutting edge innovations across industries, to tell the stories that define them far more than their titles. My guest today is Valerie Singer. Well, thanks so much, Valerie, for joining me here today on the vodcast. Greatly appreciate it. Oh, thank and thank you for having me, Sarah. This is really a joy and pleasure to be here. Of course. So let's dive in. Okay. So how would you say that your culture has shaped you personally as well as professionally? Uh, it's a great question. So I'll give you a little bit of history and background. So I grew up on the West Coast and moved to the East Coast when I was a teenager. And so I actually had these sort of like, you know, uh, bi-coastal cultural elements to my personality. Um, and I also grew up in a single parent family. And so it was, uh, it was interesting. So my mother was really pretty scrappy, um, raising three kids. And so we, you know, some culturally, um, it was really important for me to be very, um, industrious, very ambitious really early on. Um, and so, you know, that gave me a strong sense of ownership, a strong sense that I could accomplish things on my own. When I was 11, uh, I took in transcribing and, uh, and typing. Wow. As an 11 year old, so I had a little typewriter in my bedroom, and I would I would take in um, different transcription tapes and then transcribe them after school just to make a little bit of money. Um, and so, you know, that kind of work culture has really permeated everything that I do um, and how I approach the world. And so, I've been kind of at this for a really long time, I guess. You know, when I start <laughs> to think about the age of 11 and then continuing into my career, but uh, I was a pretty fast typist at 11, so that also helped later when uh, when I when I went into the computing industry for sure. Amazing. So who would you say along your journey has inspired you the most or even what, whether it is a person or, or something? I think it's a bunch of people. And so, you know, I've, I have collected so many phenomenal, phenomenal friends, um, people who have helped me in my career. That's not like one person who has been seminal to that. It's been like just a lot of people. And um, and I love learning from other people. I love, you know, kind of just understanding where they come from and what their backgrounds are. And so I, I really do like to assemble a lot of different people around me who give me different viewpoints. Um, and hopefully I can also provide the same inspiration for. So uh, it's less one person. But if I have to think about people I admire, um, my father-in-law passed away during COVID. He was 95, but he was an autodidact. So he was very self-taught. Um, but he was just like just a phenomenal intellect and so curious all the way to the last. He was already um, taking classes at George Mason University into his 90s. Wow. Um, he was just so intellectually curious. He taught himself how to, how to speak Italian. And so, you know, he was just such an inspiration of a person who really took lifelong learning, you know, and, and being self-taught seriously uh, and continued to educate himself until he was 95. That's amazing. And so given that, I, I've heard a few uh, leadership principles mentioned, you know, in, in your responses yeah. thus far. What would you say is your most favorite leadership principle at Amazon and why? Uh, I'll give you a leadership principle and I'll give you a concept. How about that? Love it. So, uh, so my favorite leadership principle is ownership. And it's one of the things that I think really differentiates Amazon from other companies is, is that everybody's an owner. And everybody not only has the ability to own, but the ability to make change happen for customers, no matter what level of the company you're in. Um, and so I've had a lot of opportunities in the 10 years that I've been affiliated with AWS uh, to make change happen, to change the way that we engage with partners, to change the way we engage with satellite and space partners and customers, um, to change the way that we interoperate with public sector. Um, and so ownership is really important. Um, and then the second concept, which is not a leadership principle, but I think really important, is uh, dealing with ambiguity. Um, and so we don't always have the answers, and we can, we sometimes have to be really uncomfortable in not knowing. Uh, but dealing with that ambiguity and understanding that, you know, in chaos comes a lot of opportunity for innovation is a really important concept. And it's something that I've learned to embrace over my career. Like, I don't always know, but I always know that I can figure it out. I completely agree in, to that point. So given generative AI is now in every discussion, you know, how do you see that as you know, an emerging technology influencing the global education space, given you do oversee that team? Yeah, it's uh, it. There is such promise in generative AI, and so you know, thinking about student outcomes and how we can really improve the value of education for students through generative AI is so incredibly inspiring to me too. 
uh, how we conduct research and, and just look for citations and look for other research elements that can combine with the research that academic researchers are doing to help to move their research forward faster. Generative AI can do that. Coding much quicker so that our researchers and acad academicians don't have to do all of the hard coding. They can leave that to a generative AI tool um, is super important. Um, and even bringing it into the classroom and, you know, picking on it a little bit, right? Are we introducing bias and how do we how do we relieve the bias out of generative AI is something that our learners in academic institutions are also working on so the tools will continue to get better. So I just, I see it as a really interesting moment in our time uh, that's going so quickly, but also has so much promise for education. Agreed. How would you say generative AI may impact positively ed techs as well? So ed techs are using uh, generative AI now for uh, for things like coaching, right? So when an online provider like a Coursera is uh, providing online instruction to learners and a learner gets stuck, uh, they have a generative AI-based uh, chatbot called Coach that you know you can just ask a question to. So I see that a lot in the background. Uh, the other way generative AI is being used is to direct students towards the learning paths that are most impactful for them. Uh, so, for instance, if I've taken a bunch of credit classes and I want to continue to move in a direction and optimize those credits so that I'm not like maybe taking a bunch of classes that might not be terribly useful, uh, generative AI tools can help, you know, with that. Um, and then finally, even on the K through 12 side um, and in higher ed, uh, generative AI tools for learning assessment diagnostics can be really helpful for improving literacy, for making sure that students can matriculate to the next levels um, and, and really are succeeding as they're moving in their pathways to education on even in the very, very young learning kind of spectrum. So it's kind of all over the place with head tech right now, which is great. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, yeah. given all of the inspiring work you you and your team are doing, what drives you to make the world a better place? Uh, you know, I see such promise in this world. It's something that um, that I have been committed to for a long time. So I spend a lot of time in my extracurricular life uh, volunteering and being involved in the community. I went back to school very, very late for my master's. Um, in fact, I was doing my master's as my youngest child was doing her master's. So we were kind of doing them together. Yeah. And um, and the the advent of that was really to move towards more uh, more tech for good, um, and to see how I could positively impact the world uh, through public administration, through public policy. Um, and so I did that very very late in life with the commitment to continuing to give back what I had received, both as a young person as well as throughout my career. I've also tried really hard to take advantage of the opportunities that were in front of me. Uh, so, for instance, when my kids were actually pretty small, I had the opportunity to move overseas. Wow. Uh, and I'm, you know, I have a husband who also is working. Uh, and so we all just sort of gamely packed it up and moved to London for four years. Um, and that was, that was interesting, you know, to create a support system in a place we really didn't have a support system, but we did. And so, you know, that dealing with ambiguity again right. was, came in really handy. <laughs> uh, and so I, I once told a boss, I can live in chaos for very short periods of time. And then I try really to, you know, to make sure that I coordinate a lot of support and a lot of like systems. But, uh, but it, was, it was a good learning experience that, first of all, you can make a home anywhere. Uh, you can create a support system around you, and you can stay really productive and learn tremendous amounts of things, uh, you know, when you kind of jump in the deep end and, and see how it all kind of materializes. Amazing. And my last question for you is just in the education space, what trends and opportunities are you most excited about for education around the world? We are at a really interesting crossroads in education. Um, and a lot was compelled by covid uh, where students went online really quickly, and we thought that was going to last. I mean, we thought online learning was going to go on forever. And certainly we've seen changes in how we approach online learning, but it hasn't become the, the single destination. We've all gone back into the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, but higher education in particular is at, I think, a pivotal moment. Thinking about education differently um, and thinking about micro-credentialing and badging and how a student learns from the time he, she, or they, you know, enters the school system until they retire from their careers is really different now. And I'm so excited about the possibility that our learners never stop their journeys and that we have the ability to touch learners throughout their careers and help them pivot in ways that they might not have known about. 
um, and that we may be able to break down some barriers to diversity. Higher education is reinventing itself. The ed tech community is helping that and helping to foster that kind of discussion. And our learners who are coming up, coming up through K-12 are the most digitally savvy we've ever seen. So all that being said, there's still a huge digital divide. And there's such an opportunity for people around the world to participate fully in this economy. And that's where I hope to really have an impact. And so I'm super excited about not just the changes that are happening in higher ed, but how it can positively impact people who might not otherwise have been able to take advantage of those changes to really change the growth trajectory of what our employers are going to be looking for in hires, how they're going to be seeking hires, and how flexible they're going to be in the kinds of hires that they're bringing on board. So we're at a really interesting time in, in the world. I'm super excited about it. Well, I'm excited to see all that your team continues to do with those opportunities to really help make the world a better place for learners and making education more accessible you know, for everyone. So thank you so much, Valerie, for being here with me today. Oh, thank you. This was such a pleasure, and I appreciate all the time that you've given me, too.